So syscall, how does it work? Well, the first thing that happens when you issue the syscall assembly instruction is that it saves the RIP of the address after the syscall, which is basically the place you're going to return to, into RCX. So it's not pushing on the stack, it saves it into this register. And the kernel is going to be responsible for you know, using that to get back to the RIP. It then changes the RIP for kernel space into a value that is stored in this MSR. Now again, remember that MSRs can only be written by ring zero, so no danger there of the attacker just pointing this somewhere else unless they already have ring zero. So that MSR holds the kernel's RIP value. Then it saves off R flags into the R11 register. And then an interesting little bit of configuration happens here. The R flags register will be masked against this IA32 F mask MSR. And so any bit that is set to one in this MSR will be cleared in the R flags at the time that it gets into kernel space. So it's not just ending, it's not just oring, it's more like you take IA32 F mask, invert it, so every one becomes a zero, every zero becomes one, and then you and the R flags with the inverted value so that it essentially clears all the bits that were said to be cleared in the F mask. Furthermore, it's going to load the CS value for kernel space with a value from IA32 star bits 47 to 32. And then SS is going to just be CS plus eight. So if these bits, basically they're, you know, CS, it's a segment selector type value. So if these bits were zero, then SS would be eight. If these bits were eight, then SS would be 16. And regardless of what the value is, it would still always be interpreted as a segment selector as we've seen in the past. And you know, all of this goop is why it's actually easier to just read the manual's uh, operation pseudocode, which we'll actually see in a little bit here, to really understand what's going on because these type of assembly instructions are extremely complicated. Now, an interesting thing is that normally you would expect that you know, RIP and CS would combine with RSP and SS in order to say, you know, where's my new code, where's my new stack? And so while it does define a stack segment here, it doesn't actually uh, define a way that RSP is saved. So it's ultimately up to either user space side before it gets into kernel or kernel side after it gets into kernel to save the RSP and make sure that it gets restored. Again, if the kernel saves it, kernel should restore it. When user space saves it, user space should restore it. All right, now that's paired with the sysret system return, system call return. So what does that do? Well, it has to do kind of the inverse of the syscall, of course. So the RIP is going to be restored from RCX. So you know the, the kernel side needs to make sure that it, if it, if it used RCX for something else, anytime in kernel space, it better put it back to the RIP of after, after the syscall so that it can get back there. The R flags is going to be restored from R11, so all that bit masking and stuff that happened doesn't matter because the original value got stored to R11, so it can just put it back. The CS gets set to a value in this IA32 star register, bits 63 to 48, so those are not the same bits. The previous one was 47 to 32, so this is 63 to 48. And then it takes that value and it just adds 16 to it. So again, it's going to just kind of increment it up so that it's effectively moving the index within the GDT. And I'll show a sort of visualization of that in a second. SS, on the other hand, gets IA32 star bits 63 through 48. So same bits, but 8 is added instead of 16. So basically the SS is going to be below the, uh, the code segment. And again, whichever side of kernel user space saved off the RSP is responsible for now restoring it. So syscall and sysret are another thing that is perfectly balanced as all things should be.